Good morning, distinguished guests. My name is Andrea Riera, and today I will serve as your mistress of ceremonies. It is my pleasure to welcome you today and formally open the Women's History Month events. We will now begin with our welcome from our esteemed chancellor, Dr. Lawrence B. Alexander. Immediately following him, we'll have our Miss University, Ms. Jada West, speak on the purpose of the celebration. Good morning. Good morning. I said good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so happy to see all of you here this morning. Welcome to Women's History Month celebration. Here at the, here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. It's indeed a pleasure to extend our sincere appreciation to each of you for taking a moment out of your day to join us. Women's History Month is a time for us to recognize and salute women's contributions to the American family and to society. Women have been making these contributions since, well, since the beginning of time. <laughs> they continue to strengthen the family and enrich our lives with intellectual gifts, creative talents, and an indomitable spirit in business, government, philanthropy, religious life, education, health, the military, sports, the arts, and many, many others. Therefore, we pay tribute and we celebrate women of all backgrounds and cultures during this special occasion. Let's give the women a hand. We are so pleased and honored to have with us today Republican strategist and commentator, Mrs. Anna Navarro, as our keynote speaker. She's one of the leading Hispanic Republican political voices in the United States. Political commentator on CNN, ABC, and Telemundo. Mrs. Navarro frequently comments on political issues and current affairs and national and international print media. Thank you, Ms. Navarro, for taking time out of your schedule to be with us this morning. We extend to you a roaring Golden Lion welcome. We certainly look forward to hearing you speak as you offer words of inspiration and wisdom. Once again, I want to thank everybody, each of you, for coming out today on this delightful occasion as we recognize and celebrate women we hope that you enjoyed the program, and we hope that your experience with us in Golden Lion Country is golden. Thank you so very much. Sabayri kakua, salasar pranam praja. Bendito sea el nombre del Señor. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Greetings, Golden Lion family. I am Jade Saichai West a senior multimedia communications major from Little Rock, Arkansas, and I joyfully serve as the 90th Miss University of Arkansas at Pine Club. <laughs> On February 28, 1980, President Jimmy Carter wrote, from the first settlers who came to our shores, from the first American Indian families who befriended them, men and women, have worked together to build this nation. Too often, the women were unsung and sometimes their contributions went unnoticed. These words, part of his message, establishing the first Women's History Week in 1980, mark the beginning of a new chapter in American history, one in which recognition of women and their work and the promotion of their rights became a more explicit concern. That initial effort was expanded in 1987 when March was designated as Women's History Month. In 1978, in California, the Education Task Force of the Sonoma County Commission on the Status of Women began a Women's History Week celebration. The week was chosen to coincide with International Women's Day, March 8. In 1987, at the request of the National Women's History Project, Congress expanded the week to a month and the U.S. Congress has issued a resolution every year since then with wide support for Women's History Month. The U.S. President has issued each year a proclamation of Women's History Month. 
To further extend the inclusion of women's history in the history curriculum and in everyday consciousness of history, the President's Commission on the Celebration of Women in History in America met through the 1990s. One result has been the effort toward establishing a National Museum of Human, Women's History for the Washington, D.C. area, where it would join other museums, such as the American History Museum. The purpose of Women's History Month is to increase consciousness and knowledge of women's history, to take one month of the year to remember the contributions of notable and ordinary women, in hopes that the day will soon come when it's impossible to teach or learn history without remembering these contributions. Thank you. Standing in for our Student Government Association President will be Ms. Alexandria Slater, who will then immediately be followed by Ms. Amaya Fife. Good morning. I am Alexandria Slater. I am from Dumas, Arkansas, majoring in Human Science Education. And today I will be doing the introduction of speaker of Ms. Anna Navarro. Anna Navarro is a well-known Republican strategist, political analyst for CNN, and Telemundo, and a co-host of ABC's The View. Anna speaks the truth and is willing to speak the truth to power without reservation. She has the ear of lots of elected officials. And Republican consultant Brett O'Donnell, she is in touch with the political issues people are talking about, and in presentations she discusses the latest hot-button issues in, in politics giving audiences and an insider's view of the upcoming elections and roadmap where the country is headed. The Barrow most recently served as a National Hispanic Co-Chair for Governor John Hussman 2012 campaign and the National Co-Chair of John McCain's Hispanic Co-Chair Hispanic Advisory Council in 2008, where she was also the National Surrogate for the McCain 2008 campaign. She has played a role in several federal and state races in Florida. She served in, on Governor John she served on Governor Jeb Bush's transition team in 1998 and was his first director of immigration policy in the executive office of the governor. Navarro is a graduate of the University of Miami. In 1993, she obtained her bachelor's in Latin American studies and political science. She obtained a Juris doctorate in 1997. She was also born in Nicaragua in 1980 and as, as a result of the Sandista Revolution. She and her family immigrated to the United States. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Amaya Five. I'm a graduating senior at the university. And, <laughs> and I will be representing the best choir. Um, I'm going to sing a spiritual, I'm going to sing Precious Lord. So. Precious Lord, take my hand, please.
tell you all, I feel under the weather, underdressed, under everything, but you all have lifted my spirits today and I am so happy to be here. I have guys are nice. I have forgotten how nice people in the South there are because I've been spending a lot of time in New York. You know, the city that gave us Goldberg calls him the guy in the White House. I call him President Local. But lately I'd like to call him President Impeached Local. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm warning you, I'm coughing a little bit. I don't have the coronavirus, though I do confess I have consumed a lot of corona. <laughs> but you, you know, I keep telling you all to keep your distance you all are still wanting to hug me and take pictures, so you've been warned, do not sue me if you get some sort of something or other. I've noticed though that there's like, there's no instances of anything in places like Latin America. You know, I've been looking in my home country of Nicaragua, I've been looking, there's nothing, and I'm like, because really, it's like nothing kills us. Nothing kills us, right? It's hard to make us afraid. But <laughs> on a serious note, First, you know, they, they wanted me to, um, the organizers of this, and I, I really can't thank you enough. Oh my God, you all look so pretty. You're so dressed up and beautiful. But I, um, they, they wanted me to give a speech and then take questions, but since I've come to this campus, I feel like I'm, a, I'm with family. And the questions I've gotten from everybody, from the students, from the police officer, from everybody, have been so poignant and so good that the last thing I want is to talk to you, I want to talk with you. So I, I'm just going to speak very shortly and then open it up to questions. And you can ask me about any damn thing you have in your mind. I will, I am who I am, I'm blunt, I'll tell you the truth. You want to talk about Whoopi Goldberg, we can talk about Whoopi Goldberg. You want to talk about he whose name shall not be mentioned, we can talk about him too. Only thing I will not talk about is my weight. <laughs> For which I also blame Trump. Have you all seen my Twitter profile picture? I swear I had a waist once. <laughs> now I've got so many chins I've stopped counting. But, um, so let me just say a few things before opening it up to questions and start thinking about anything you want to ask. And really, politics, work-life balance, anything you want to ask, I'm, I'm game for. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me here. In the midst of so, so much going on, Thank you for showing up uh, this morning to, to listen. And, you know, in February we celebrated Black History Month. Now it's March and it's Women's History Month. And you'll always find people complaining about it. Why do blacks need their own month? Why do Hispanics need their own month? Actually, Hispanics, since we're always late, we get two months because we get there, we're like halfway into September and halfway into October because it takes us 15 days to figure it out in September. You know, but why do women get their own month? Well, you know, that's racism. That's reverse racism. That's identity politics. Why can't white men have their own month? Well, the reason groups like ours have their own history month is because for far too long, our history, our truth, our stories, our contributions, our richness, what we have done, what we have accomplished has been misrepresented, has been ignored, or has been erased from history. That's what we have to our lives. To highlight that which for far too long has not been part of the history books. And the reason there is no white men's history month is because every damn day in America is white men's history day. And look, I'm all about equal opportunity. So if if Trump supporters want to have an Orange Man History Month, I'm good with that. And before we continue, I want to, you can laugh. I want to talk more specifically about, about three things, which you're going to hear a lot. And you're going to hear a lot as the campaigns get, um, you know, we, as, as the campaign's climax and the political season gets even crazier, which is hard to imagine. But, you know, I want to talk about the word diversity. I want to talk about 
the need for representation, and the so-called term identity politics. And look, as far as diversity, I think too often people think diversity is uh, checking off a box, you know, having somebody around the table, black person, check, Hispanic person, check, one-eyed person, check, woman, check, LGBTQ, check, but we are not check marks, and we are not our place in history, not as women, not as African Americans, not as Hispanics, not as LGBTQ, not as disabled. We are not at a place in America where we can just go sit around the table and be. And so if we get to be in that room, if we get to be around that table, we are there to represent. We're not there to just sit pretty. And I think it is so important for when people like us get in a room, to leave the door open and make sure others are able to come in behind us. We cannot afford to suffer from the crab syndrome. We just can't. You know, I, I, I hope, I hope there is a day where um, somebody that looks like me or looks like you can just go sit in a room and sit and be and crack bad jokes and hear two things and play it on solitaire on their iPhone. But we're not there yet. We are there to speak for those who have no voice. We are there to speak and act for those who are not in the room. And so that, to me, is diversity. And if diversity means shaking up the boat, if diversity means making people uncomfortable, if diversity means bringing up issues that others don't want brought up because it's awkward or because they want to avoid it or pretend it's not there, well, that's why we are there to be that voice and to speak about those issues. The other thing I wanted to talk about was representation. You know, I, I often get asked, why do you make such a big deal? Why do you always have to talk about all the women on the stage? Why can't you just treat them like if they were other candidates? Well, because for 200 years, we haven't seen a stage that looks like yet, that. Because when Barack Obama bends over and a little black boy touches his head, and can tell that his hair is just like his, it matters. When a little girl can look and see a Ruth Bader Ginsburg or a Elena Kagan or a Sonia Sotomayor dressed in judges' robes sitting on the Supreme Court, it matters. It inspires you. When an LGBTQ youth who might be getting bullied in school can see a Pete Buttigieg and Chastin Buttigieg embracing on a debate stage, it matters. It matters. And when you get up and you see a Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren and you see Gillibrand and you see Klobuchar on a stage running for president, little girls no longer have to ask their parents, when I grow up, can I run for president? Yes, you can. And they are showing you that they can. And that, that, when you get asked, you know, why does it matter? Why are you voting for somebody because they're this? Or why are you voting for somebody that because of they're that? They're going, you know, people like to make you feel bad about being proud of who you are and your ethnicity and that being an issue. And you know, they, they, they've coined this term, identity politics, as if it's a bad thing. Well, here's my question. Why is it bad for me to identify and make issues that are important to the Hispanic community or to women or to the African American community. Why is that identity politics, but um, voting for somebody because they're going to place somebody in the Supreme Court that's a conservative, why isn't that identity? Why isn't uh, voting for somebody who's going to lower the tax rates? Why isn't that identity? Why is it just my skin color or my ethnicity or my gender that qualifies as identity? but you not wanting to give up your gun or voting on gun rights or voting on abortion rights or voting on your pocket or voting on trade, why isn't that identity? So you know what? If you want to accuse me of identity politics, hell yes, I vote on identity politics because I vote for people who represent my needs and my priorities and I am not embarrassed to admit that. And neither should you. <laughs> I'm coughing so bad, guys. I'm sorry. If I start screaming too much, you're going to have to get me out of here on a stretcher. <laughs> and somebody, you know, somebody asked me today about how do we know we're making a difference and how do you know, you know, one person can do something. 
And, and I started thinking about the Women's March. You guys remember that, the day after the swearing-in? That was started by a housewife in Hawaii who went on Facebook and was so frustrated by the election results, she typed, the day after the inauguration, the swearing-in, I'm going to Washington, I'm going to march. And she woke up the next day, remember this is Hawaii, they're like 10 hours different. And I really don't even understand how anybody in Hawaii can be thinking about politics because Hawaii is nice, you guys. <laughs> and, and she woke up the next day, 10,000 people had responded, we're coming with you. And then it was 20,000, and then it was 100,000. And it turned into a march all over the country, a peaceful march of women saying, we are here. And I think because of that march and because of women's frustration, that led to the hashtag and the Me Too movement. And because women spoke up, women who had been silent and quiet and kept their shame to themselves for so many decades, spoke up and told about what had happened to them, it has made a difference. Harvey Weinstein is in prison. Is he in prison or is he still pretending to be sick in a hospital? <laughs> Let me just say this about Harvey Weinstein, because I gotta get it out of my system. Do you see this guy? I mean, you know, he's like this big Hollywood producer. Who the hell knew he was an actor? Do you see him pretending not to be able to walk? And then all of a sudden he gets convicted and he's like, Lazarus? I hope he goes and finds Jesus in prison. But, you know, if it weren't for women coming together, enforcing each other, strengthening each other, holding each other, backing each other up. The changes we are seeing on that and people paying the consequences for decades of getting away with, with, with terrible behavior would not be happening today. And you know, people, people say, but you know, why Women's History Month? Well, because of Harriet Tubman, because I want her story told and because of Shirley Chisholm, and because of Susan B. Anthony, and because it was 100 years ago that we didn't have the right to vote. And we cannot forget that. We cannot forget that. And you know, this is the, the last thing I'm gonna say before opening it up to questions. In the last seven days, um, we have seen John Lewis get up from his sickbed. Guy's dealing with pancreatic stage four cancer. That's as tough, as tough a diagnosis and prognosis as it gets. And he got up, and he got up and he went to Selma, and he greeted people there. And he greeted people so that we could all be reminded that there was a day when we could not vote. Whether you're a woman, whether you're a black person, there was a day in America where you did not have the right to vote. And so if John Lewis can get up from his sickbed, and show up in Selma, damn it, we have got to get up and show up in November. Staying home and walking away is not an option. And you know, on Super Tuesday yesterday, I was watching the clips of this man in, in Texas. Did any of you see it? Harvest Rogers? Man stood seven hours in order to vote. And he said, you know, they want me to walk away. They want me to get frustrated. They want me to get tired. But I'm not walking away from my vote. And you know what? That's going to happen in November. It's going to happen in places like Arkansas, places like where I live in Florida. We saw it happen in Georgia. It's going to happen in places like Texas. And I bet you it's going to happen in precincts of where we live. And we can't let that happen. We can't walk away from our vote. So if that means packing a snack and wearing comfortable shoes and charging your phones and putting your iPods and bringing a book, you have got to sit there, you've got to stand there because walking away from the right to vote leads to terrible, terrible consequences. It was because there were people who didn't vote in 2016 that we ended up where we have ended up. And so, you know, there's, there's things in life which are binary choices, which are not binary choices. If you go to Starbucks, you literally can order 10 different types of milk. <laughs> Presidential races are, are binary choices. It's either this choice or that choice. And if you're not voting for this one, you're voting for that. 
And if you're not voting, you're voting for the one that's going to win. So staying home, staying home is not an option. And then there's people who've come before us who fought too hard, who literally lost their lives, who were beaten into pulps to give us that right. So listen, if you're sleepy today, if you're playing on your iPhone, if you don't care who I am, just listen to that one thing. Come November, please show up and do not walk away from your right to vote. Okay, and now let's move on to the questions. Who wants to ask what? Uh, my name is Leon Jones III. I'm a political science major here at the University and I'm a junior. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you for everything that you've said. Um, it, it's something that we need to hear uh, more often. And second, a lot of times we hear men say things like, women's issues aren't my issues, um, it's not my place to help out with women's issues, or even people who say things like, I can't speak for another person because I'm not them. Um, how do you recommend that uh, we as men can use our privilege like of being a man to help women, to help further the cause of women's rights? Look, Every man has a mother, right? You can, you, there can be a lot of things you can't have, but everybody needs a mother. And so if you have a mother, you should care about women's issues. If you have a sister, you should care about women's issues. If you have a wife, you should care about women's issues. If you have an aunt, you should definitely care about women's issues. We don't live as islands. We don't live as islands. Things like this uh, coronavirus should teach us that. You know, we, we can't isolate ourselves here from something that's happening in China or elsewhere. We are one community, we are one citizen. And, and I think that the sooner we learn that we're all in this together, and we are one big family, and I'll tell you what I think is very important. Being a storyteller, being a messenger, and also being a recipient of stories. And I'm kind of weaving you know, black history and women's history together, but I, I remember when, do you all remember when Barack Obama gave that race speech? I think it was after the, during that Trayvon Martin trial in Florida. I had, a, I had friends, I had a lot of friends say, you know, why does he always make it about race? And what, what's this thing, you know, about the talk? And people who don't have black friends don't know that every black parent has to have a conversation with their teenage son or daughter about what to do if they get stopped by police. It is a foreign concept to people who don't have friends that share that. And so I say to women, I say to dreamers, I say to share your stories. Don't keep it in. Share your story so that people know it's real so that people know what it's like to be discriminated for being a woman, or being an immigrant, or being African American, or having an accent. You know, I didn't know I had an accent until I got on TV. I really didn't. <laughs> and you all laugh. So I get on TV, and I start getting all these um, tweets. And the people who like me would talk to me about, tweet me about my sexy Latina accent. And the people who didn't like me would tell me to go eat another burrito and go back to Mexico. Which is stupid because I'm not from Mexico. <laughs> but I've discovered being on TV that there is a very real and close connection between stupidity and racism and bigotry. It takes stupidity to be a bigot. And so really it's very hard to explain to these people that, that you're not from Mexico, that not everybody from Latin America is from Mexico. So you know, they think there's like the big Mexico and then the little Mexico's in the middle and then Mexico surrounded by water, you know. It's a whole thing. So, um, then I get home one day and I ask, uh, I ask my, my, you know, husband who was, you know, from Idaho. I said, you know, do I have an accent? And he starts laughing. I'm like, I'm from Miami. Everybody speaks like me. Have you guys heard Pitbull? Okay, he was born in Miami. I was born in Nicaragua. What is his excuse? But the point, the point that I was getting back to is don't be afraid to talk about who you are and what your story is and make people listen and force people to listen. And don't assume people know. 
what you know or what you've been through. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little example from, from this week, two weeks ago. Bernie Sanders made a comment about, uh, I live in Miami, my husband is Cuban-American, I switched, decided there were things I wanted to do in Spanish. Um, and, you know, and I'm from, I was born in Nicaragua, we both fled communism. And Bernie Sanders made a comment about some of the, you know, positive aspects of, of, of the Castro Revolution. Well, that don't fly. That, that just, that is the one trigger point I, I you know, I can't, I, I just can't look away from or look the other way from. And, but I've got to explain to people why that is, what my reality is. You know, I gotta explain to people that there are political prisoners, that there are people still getting killed and getting jailed for being political dissidents in places like Cuba and Nicaragua. And why for me that is unacceptable. And so I can't assume that people know that. And I can't judge people if they think differently, if they don't know the facts. So I have a duty, as women have a duty, as African Americans have a duty, to share our stories and force people to listen. If after that, they're still pretending to be stupid, then you, there's nothing you can do. But you have, I mean, there's some people you just can't help. You know, I mean, there's some people that are so stupid, you just can't help. If somebody, you know, people ask me about fake news all the time. How do you combat fake news? I don't know how you combat uh, stupidity. If somebody wants to believe that Bill and Hillary Clinton are running a sex ring out of the basement of a pizza shop that doesn't have a basement, to the point where they show up with a gun to save the victims of the sex ring, how do you combat that? I mean, how do you combat that level of, 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 of stupid? Sometimes you just gotta, you know, give up. Let them be stupid. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is James Robinson. I'm a freshman at the university. And we hear um, a lot of issues, whether on the news or in real life, about discrimination, harassment, and politics. What is something that you think that we can do as a society to like, bridge the gap between men and women? Just in the workplace? I think so much has happened in the last two years. Um, and you know, and I, and I think it's because people have told their stories. Look, I, I, um, I remember when the Me Too thing started happening, and I'm on the board of Time's Up, and it's an issue that's very important to me. I remember uh, when I was watching um, Meet the Press that, that Sunday with my husband, and there were all these powerful women, people like Elizabeth Warren, people like the senator from Hawaii, people like, Amy Klobuchar talking about their sexual harassment stories. And my husband turned to me and said, have you ever been sexually harassed? I said, no, you know, too much of a badass. Who would dare harass me? And then I sat there for five minutes and I was like, oh wait, you know what? I just remembered this. Oh wait, you know what? I just remembered that. And sitting there, I, I remembered all these things that have happened that I've just, kind of accept it as, that's the modus operandi, that's how, that's how it works in corporate America, that's how it works in politics, that's how it works in media. And, and I think it's so important for, um, for women and men not to accept it, not to accept it as normal. And I will tell you, you know, people ask me sometimes to find a silver lining to the Trump administration. And if I consume enough alcohol and sit there for enough time, I will find one. And it is, I think the Me Too movement happened because of Donald Trump. I think women were so pissed off and so upset that for decades of silence, there was somebody who bragged about sexual assault, who was sitting in the White House and got away with it, that they said, no more silence, we are going to speak up. And I think that Donald Trump has resulted in a level of wokeness in America. We have taken our rights a little too for granted. It was too easy. And, and, and there's a level of engagement and information and, and outrage and justified enragement in the last three and a half years. 
And I think it is because of that, because we realize that we've got to show up and that we've got to be active. Thank you. Before we get to the next question, may I ask you this? How do you respond to people who still say that's a man's job or that's a woman's job? And not consider that either one might be. But give me an example. It's a man's job. It's a woman's job to take care of the kitchen and clean up and cook and take care of the children. It's a man's job to go out and work and bring in the whatever's going to take care of the family. And I want to find myself a man who can keep me to my levels. <laughs> if I could, you know, in my next life I want to come back as a kept woman. <laughs> I just... Look, I, I, you know, I think, I think everybody's got to do what works for them. And, and I do think, um, particularly in the Hispanic community, I, I would suspect also in the black community, there's some taboos about that, right? Where the man needs to make more money. Uh, or there's certain things that the man couldn't do. Look, my husband can't cook. There is no women's right revolution that's going to happen, equality revolution, that is going to make that man be able to cook. <laughs> but he knows that if mama's out working, he knows where the Grubhub app is. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's just, I think we as women have got to, and as people, as humans, have got to be less focused on labels and on how other people do it and how other people are expected to do it and do what works for us. I have, I have friends who are married, you know, women friends who are married to stay at home uh, men. I mean, for me, that would be, very difficult. I want him out there and I want him working. And there better be a check coming in at the end of the and you, you know, I want to be married to a man who can pay their, his mortgage. But they don't. They like, you know, they are very happy married to men who tend the garden. And I can't, I, and we as women are very harsh with each other as judges. I often think that we are each other's harsh, we, we as women judge each other more harshly than other than men judges. And so look, if women are happy married to somebody who's making less money, great. If they have a man who can cook, great. I also have a lot of women friends who can't even make a peanut butter sandwich. I just gotta I think you gotta you gotta do you. You gotta be who you are and be comfortable with that and 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 who cares what anybody else thinks and about traditional roles. Do what works what works for you. Marriage and life is hard enough. But I really don't like anybody in my kitchen. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm a freshman at the University of Arkansas. I'm a chemistry major. Um, I, I know you've been all over around the world, but I do have this question because it does happen over all over around the world. How do you react to when people not really discriminate their own culture? Like, I'm Salvadorian, and most people, you know, that are part of my culture that grew up here have different views on the political co uh, culture of this country. Mm. I have been all over the world, and it's, you know, it's, um, by the way, I was in Africa this summer, and I came back and I told, uh, you know, all my black friends, next time Donald Trump says, go back to where you came from, you might want to take him up on it, because Africa is beautiful. <laughs> Look, um, you know what's funny? When you travel, who you are, I, I, do you all know who Skip Gates is, Dr. Henry Louis Gates? So he did, he did a program on me, right? Um, he did a segment on me. And my father, like every Latin with two dimes to rub together, thinks he is a direct descendant of Spanish royalty. And so he's been obsessed with this since I was a kid. And I did it just for him. So I say yes to Skip. They send this horrible questionnaire asking everything you could possibly ask about a human being. I send back all the answers and I don't hear a peep from uh, Skip or his people for like two weeks. And I turn around to my husband and I said, I think I just gave all my personal information to the Russians. 
But Skip ends up doing this, and it was incredibly poignant and, and, and so meaningful. And he asked me, where are you from? And I said to him, you know, I said, what do you mean? He says, yeah, when people ask you where you're from, what do you tell them? And I said, well, where I'm from depends on where I am. So if I'm in Arkansas and you ask me, I'm from Florida. If I'm in Florida and you ask me, I'm from Miami. If I'm in Miami and you ask me, I'm from Nicaragua. If I'm in Nicaragua and you ask me, I'm in, from Chinandega. If I'm in Africa and you ask me, I'm from the United States. And so I think, you know, I think who we are is so dependent on, on, on the circumstances around us and, and where we are. And you're right. You and I know, you know, I'm from Nicaragua, you're from El Salvador. The shadeism amongst Hispanics is fierce. It's fierce. And the difference between, you know, some, sometimes I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm places and somebody will say to me, oh, but you don't look Nicaraguan. And I'll be like, because what does a Nicaraguan look like? You want me in a loincloth hanging from a rope on a tree? What, I mean, what, what does a Nicaraguan look like? And they, you know, they won't, they, they, they then don't go that, that extra mile. So I think in life you are going to get challenged for your beliefs all the time. And you're going to question yourself sometimes. And that's normal. And to evolve is normal. There's issues on which I've, uh, I've evolved <coughs> or changed my mind. And I think it's really important, particularly when you're in college, to really figure out who you are and what you believe in so that when you get challenged, you know what your convictions and your principles and your ideology and your values are, and you can and you can stick to them without compromising and without uh, feeling bullied or feeling peer pressured. So, you know, if you are the one person in the room who thinks, uh, you know, climate change is a Chinese hoax, well, you wouldn't because you're a chemistry major, so you actually know science, but. You know, if, if that's what you want to believe and if that's who you are, embrace your stupid. You know, but you have to be very comfortable and very self-confident in, in your own voice. My name is Gabrielle Williams. I'm a graduating senior majoring in political science. And my question for you is, how do we change the narrative as women in abortion rights when there's white men making those policies? You know, I think the first thing we need to do on abortion rights is, uh, you know, in the entire issue of pro-life, pro-choice, is not call it pro-life or pro-choice, because it's a lot more complicated than 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 a you know a little term that means one thing or another. And you know about sharing the stories. I remember um, when when Alabama was passing their law. You know, I remember reading uh, stories about women from Alabama who were told in, you know, their third trimester that they were, they were carrying a child with encephalitis or a child who you knew was going to die and suffer terribly. So you have got to put yourself in those people's shoes. And again, you know, stop being so judgmental. Stop telling me what I should or should not do. My views are, are colored. I have a friend, uh, I have a brother who is um, severely mentally disabled, who severely, uh, you know, he's, he's 54 years old and he's got the mental and motor skills of a 12-month-old um, baby. And, you know, and I know what it does to a family. I know, you know, that my parents worry on a daily basis, what happens to him when we die? Who do we leave this responsibility to? Who will take care of my child? I know that there are families who can't afford to have one parent or both parents providing primary care for that child because they need to feed other children that are at the homes. So those stories 
need to be told because it is complex. It is complex. And, and you know, and as far as men telling us what to do, have you noticed how many of these men, when they find out their mistresses or their baby daughters are pregnant, change their minds real quick? Some of them were in Congress. When that came out, I had to leave. Because there's a lot of hypocrisy in, in this world. So look, if men want to you know, tell you what to do, then have them pay for it. You know what? You want to, why? why is it that you spend so many resources and so much political capital on the children before they're born, but not after they're born? Hi, my name is Van Steiner. I'm a freshman political science. I'm a freshman political science major. I'd like to thank you for coming here today. My question is, as a spokesperson for your community, how do you distinguish and reconcile being a promulgator for your community versus your words when taking it and apply it to the expanded community um, as if they're a monolith? I don't consider myself a spokesperson for my community because my community is very diverse. I speak my truth. I speak about who I am. And if you agree, you agree. And if you disagree, you disagree. If you feel represented, I'm really happy that you do. If you feel misrepresented, then I'm not speaking for you. I think, I think too often people think the Hispanic community, the black community, women, you know, that we are voting blocks and monoliths that, that think the same and, and look the same and talk the same. And, and we're not, right? We're not. Look, the, the Latinos in Texas just voted big time for Bernie. I assure you, in two weeks, you're going to see the Hispanics in Florida say, hell no. We are not going to be faced with a choice between a racist and a socialist. We'll take the other old white men. Thank you. Can you believe we started this race with, you know, black people, women, all sorts of things, and we end up with old white people. <laughs> old white men, straight. One who hasn't combed his hair in 40 years, one who has no hair, but is pretending. Well, two who have no hair. Whatever, go ahead. I'm Patrick Marco, a freshman mathematics major here at the university, and my question is, how have you as a woman dealt with uh, white women in uh, your line of work and understanding the issues that come in uh, other races of women in Spain instead of just focusing on the advancement of white women as far as women's rights go. Mm. <laughs> you have watched The View, right? Um, look. It comes with the territory, um, and you can't accept it, and you can't let it be normal. And, and here's what I tell people. You can't let racism or discrimination or unfairness in the workplace define you. So I remember one time I was <coughs> on this panel in Washington. I was very young. And I was with all of these national Hispanic leaders and they were being asked if they remember the first time they were discriminated against. Do you all remember the first time you were discriminated against? And so, you know, everybody was answering really poignant, heart-wrenching stories, some of them going back to kindergarten, going back to, you know, the first years of school. And I'm, I was there sweating BBs because um, I couldn't come up with anything. And uh, when it got to me, I said, look, I'm a woman, I'm an immigrant, I'm Hispanic. Uh, the likelihood I've been discriminated against is 100%. But I'm so damn arrogant, I didn't acknowledge it. And so, you, you are, the racism is always going to be out there. Discrimination is always going to be out there. Bigotry is always going to be out there. Some other people's privilege is always going to be out there. 
there is things that other people are going to be able to do that you wouldn't get away with doing. You wouldn't even think of doing because you know you can't get away with doing. That's always going to be out there. But you cannot let it break you. You cannot let it define you. You cannot go in with that mentality. You've got to just, you know, you've got to be an icebreaker. You, you know, despite the racism, despite the discrimination, first we've got to, we've got to confront it every time we see it. You know, I, I, I think I tell, I tell my, you know, my like Latino leadership friends, national Latino leadership. You know, Donald Trump had a hit TV show on NBC for several years. And this was after the Central Park Five. And this was after housing discrimination with his dad in the 70s and 80s. And this was after he had said, about, you know, this was after he had questioned Obama's citizenship, right? And right to be president. So my question is, where the hell were our communities demanding that NBC take that guy off the air before he ran for president? He had a hit show. And Hispanics and African Americans were watching and buying his tacky ties at Macy's. <laughs> right, so, and we knew all of that. And so I, I think we have a responsibility to com, you know, confront racism every single time it raises its ugly head because it is never going to cease to exist. And right now it's gotten worse. It's gotten worse because you know there was a time when being a racist or being you know, misogynist used to cost you. It could cost you a job, socially embarrass you, you'd be kicked out of Twitter, you, uh, you know, your mother would call you and say things. Nowadays, it's like, yeah, I'm a racist, y que? So what? I'm emboldened, I'm empowered, uh, you know, I make America hate again. That's great, you know, so, that is what we are confronting. It is not going away, but you can't let it define you and you've got to fight it. You can't get tired of fighting it. Okay, so this is really the last question. I guess I'm the last one. Buenos dias. Dios te bendiga. Soy Yesenia, soy de Nicaragua. Gracias por representarnos. Oh, you are? Yes. Where from? Diriamba, Nicaragua. Donde? Diriamba. Ah, okay. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, yeah, I'm a student here, but... No, I'm we're just talking bad about everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm from Diriam Manikahawa, so we're from the same country. I have followed you. Put the, the mic a little. I have followed you for many years. I'm way too sure for this. Okay. Um, <laughs> Don't worry about it. Until yesterday, Mike Bloomberg was running for president. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have watched you many years, and I appreciate your voice, um, especially coming from the Republican side. Um, for the past few years, our Hispanic communities, especially in the last four years, they have lived in fear, and due to all the changes in our immigration, they feel hopeless. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that a lot of times, minorities kind of go against all minorities. Like, we kind of go against each other instead of helping each other out. How do you think, or what do you think we can do to help each other be aware about our needs as a community? Uh, many times I have heard, why do you come here? Could you not be happy over there? Could you not be like this over there? I have, um, I usually help people from um, coming from asylum seekers and immigrants and everything. And how do you think we can kind of be able to make people more aware of what's going on back there? And that we have a responsibility to it, like the Sandinista contract. Look, anybody, uh, anytime anybody asks you, why are you here, why'd you leave there, ask them, oh, why'd you, right? Because unless you, you literally are Pocahontas' descendant, you came here too. Oh, except, you know, African Americans who, despite what Ben Carson may say, are not immigrants. Slavery is not immigration. It is slavery. And there is no other way to call it, you know, Ben Carson, my God. That's the guy who thinks the pyramids are grain silos. Oh, obviously not a graduate of this school. Um, the, 
There is so, the, 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 the problem, look, the problem, one of the big problems that I see with Trump is that he's used immigration as a way of pitting us against each other and demonizing folks. You know, yesterday, did any of you see that Schumer got admonished by, the, uh, by John Roberts of the Supreme Court because he made these statements against the two conservative judges? And I don't like the, the statements that Schumer made. I don't think they are acceptable. But, but, if you support a guy who attacked a judge, Judge Curio, because his parents were Mexican, if you support a guy who just two weeks ago attacked Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor, or attacked that judge, uh, Amy Berman, on the Roger Stone case, you have no right to tell me that I should be outraged by what Schumer said. And so it's, you know, it's the demonization of immigration that has happened in the last four years. It is so hard to hear good stories about immigrants. The only thing we hear about from, from, from Trump is you know, the bad immigrants. And there are people who come to this country and do bad things, and they deserve to be punished, and they deserve not to be here. Because if you somehow make it to the greatest country in the world and come here and break laws and cause harm, uh, you don't deserve to be here. And you're, and you're hurting the rest of us. You're hurting the rest of us. But you know, I'd love to hear every once in a while a good story, a story of, of all the good that, that immigrants are doing. And you know, and I, I don't tire of getting outraged at the hypocrisy. Now this, this administration um, is against family reunification, <laughs> except for Melania's family. And they are against um, immigrants, undocumented immigrants in the workplace, except in Donald Trump's golf courses. And so point out the hypocrisy, point out the positive, point out the contributions that Hispanics and immigrants make on a daily basis. And you know what else? We need to have allies. This is not something we can do on our, on our own. We need to be allies to other communities, and we need to ask for alliances with other communities. So really, she is the last one because Thank you. Thank you, so much. you want to keep us on time. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate your presence and your questions and you showing up. And I'm sorry I coughed on you. I would like to thank Ms. Navarro again for agreeing to speaking with us today. And I like to thank everybody for coming today. We will now have our closing remarks by Ms. Carol Brown. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your attendance and participation this year's Women's History Month program. Especially thank you for those who are listed and not listed on the program. Ms. Amaya, and Ms. Slater, thank you so much for filling in for those who are absent. Ms. Navarro, I appreciate you sincerely. We appreciate you sincerely here. Let's give her another round. Thank you.